Do animals belong in captivity? Now, although I come from a zoological background, I assure you that my only approach in this dissection is to understand the basic truth of how we treat animals in our society. And I have no agenda of propagating any material to benefit any specific party beyond animals as a whole. To be quite frank, if anything, I may be more harsh on the zoo and aquarium community because of my background. I have felt for some time now that zoos and aquariums should be the ones leading the discussion on the ethics of captivity and personally demanding the highest of expectations for others. But naturally, where they fail to grow, others are going to fill in. So now we have a massive anti-captivity movement going on because while people from the general population are showing empathy and genuine concern for the welfare of the zoo's animals, the zoos have stayed silent. And that's because they're scared of the public misinterpreting what they present. But this, of course, only incites more distrust from the anti-captivity movement. I've noticed this same trend with the recent U.S. election. One party and candidate have an agenda whose entire purpose was to reinvigorate the economy at the cost of dismantling nearly all of the environmental and ecological safeguards that our government has put into place. It seems that opposing this candidate would be a task that aligns perfectly with the missions of many zoological societies. And yet I know from experience at my zoo that organizations, they remain horrifyingly neutral. If we want to assure the public and ourselves that we do in fact exist for conservation, then we have to accept the fact that our organizations exist as ideas and that if we aren't proactively fighting for our ideas and missions, then people are going to start questioning whether we are the authority we claim to be. And that's the worst part, isn't it? As conservation educators, you spend nearly your whole life trying to inspire people to care about these animals. And now that people are finally showing some passion, they are met with either complete silence or open hostility. People in the zoo community feel threatened and to their defense feel villainized by people who don't understand animals very well at all. One of the most common trends I see in these conversations are animal care staff members being baffled by how deluded people are, thinking they know animals better than they do, and how guests allow anthropomorphism to trick themselves into self-justification. And they have a very valid point. No one understands these animals better than they do. But since this is true, those individuals should also be the ones leading the discussion on how to make those animals live the best life possible. They should not be silent, and they should not be frustrated by people asking about those animals in captivity. Because we as a zoo community should have answered all of those questions ourselves long ago. If we stay silent when it comes to questioning captivity, someone else is going to start asking questions. So let's start leading the charge in asking those questions, and let's start asking the right ones. Because if we want to claim to know the most about our animals and care the most about our animals, then we need to be the ones leading the charge on improving captivity, not them. Before we dive into it, I want to define some basic ideas on this topic, as there is a lot of insight in simply defining the word you're looking to understand. The first word is captivity, which of course refers to the condition of being confined. But how then do we define the idea of confinement? A communally agreed definition of confinement is more or less the restriction of someone or something to a certain limit. In our case, we're going to be looking at space. So then, it's fair to reason that if we are looking at what it means to have an animal in captivity, we should evaluate how we are restricting the limits of the space it occupies. In this regard, we come to one of the more philosophical aspects of the argument, which is that if an animal is in an enclosure its whole life, but never realizes it because it never reaches the limits of that enclosure, is that considered true captivity? While it's easy to think of this as no more than an outlandish claim, it's really not depending on the species in question. It's easy for us to immediately think of larger mammalian animals like elephants or horses and scoff at any notion that there's a container large enough to hold them. 
But for many smaller species, especially those of reptilian nature, those boundaries might be significantly smaller. I think it's worth recognizing that we are all currently captives on this planet for the time being, and that for all wild animals there are going to be geographical obstacles set up and natural limits to their habitat. Especially now, in an age where human settlement has taken over so much of what used to be their natural habitat, animals in the wild are more now so than ever restricted in the space they can occupy. Instead of perceiving the wild as a sort of complete freedom, we should more realistically understand that nature is full of limits and boundaries of its own, but many are simply so wide that the animal never feels captive. As I'm sure the continent of Australia is quite large enough for a wallaby to not feel confined. Many ambush predators, ectotherms, and slow metabolizers, they move too slowly and infrequently to cover much ground at all. So providing an environment for those where they'll never reach a boundary is entirely possible. It's absolutely reasonable to conclude that captivity cannot be inherently cruel when we see simply the keeping of animals as our definition of captivity. Because with the right species and the right enclosure, one could easily produce an environment that limits the animal in no way. And if it fails to restrict their space to a certain limit, then it fails our definition of captivity in the first place. Now, it's worth mentioning that there are many other factors that you could certainly limit when it comes to animal care and quality of life beyond space, but we'll get to that later. While we have determined that it is possible to keep certain animals without limiting their natural space, really a more pressing matter is how well do zoos actually do this? And what about the other species? Animals are so amazingly diverse that generalizing rules on the ethics of keeping a blue whale in captivity versus an earthworm are, are simply superfluous. We have to be willing to compromise that if we are defining the restrictions of essentially freedom in any facet as our condition of captivity, that our findings are going to vary tremendously based on species. As the resources that each needs to live, a completely unhindered life varies tremendously as well. Now, before we go into the specifics of limiting factors and quality of life measures, we have to address two important points. The first is that we hold freedom to be a paramount value in our lives. And sometimes we lose sight that realistically, freedom is a double-edged sword. We can prove quite easily that restriction of freedoms can cause things like stress, illness, depression, and boredom. And all of these are incredibly negative traits when it comes to quality of life. But in the same exact stroke, we can also talk about restrictions like diets or stressors like exercise that we know to be incredibly beneficial to health. I want to make it clear that I'm not promoting in any way the restriction of animals, but rather I'm proving that generalizations about limits and stress can be dangerous. We live in a society where people actively seek the stress of skydiving or watching a scary movie. Ensuring that your dog doesn't eat itself into a coma is a very important limitation. Preventing your children from playing with live firearms is also probably a pretty good limitation. So when we ask ourselves about the ethics of living an animal's freedom, it's important to note that sometimes limits can be good. And that really it comes down to simply balancing the animal's safety with its quality of life. The second point is that there are also freedoms that have no benefit to restriction. And these are really going to be the main focus for the remainder of our discussion. Because if we want to understand the nature of animal captivity and whether or not it's cruel, then we need to focus on the limitations that would make an animal's quality of life much worse. Zoos are institutes that are constantly changing, and this has never been more true than now. What started off mostly as circuses and exotic animal collections for purely entertainment purposes has slowly come around to be more centered on things like education, conservation, and animal welfare. And although many zoos, especially AZA-accredited ones, have made leaps and bounds in progress, to suggest that we are done changing is incredibly short-sighted. When zoos and aquariums do respond to the anti-captivity movement, one of the points that nearly always surfaces is how much research and education those facilities do. However, to be honest, I find this response to be 
almost completely inadequate, and that's not because it's false, but it rather escapes from the main focus of the argument of captivity. People are not debating whether zoos do good or bad work. They're debating whether confining animals is morally a correct thing to do. When you respond to what many people see as a form of slavery, with arguments about how that slavery helps educate people, you should not expect a very understanding response. Instead, we need to break apart the notion that captivity equates to slavery at all, and while we can continue to push that zoos and aquariums do good work, we can't possibly use that as a foundation argument against anti-captivity. It should be noted as well that scientifically, zoos have not performed very well when it comes to education and research. Statistically, a vast majority of the research done in zoos is about caring for captive animals, and a majority of surveys and studies done on zoo guests show almost no retention of information learned while they're at the zoo. I say this in no way that I wish to demonize zoos, as I believed that compared to where we were nearly a century ago, we have made amazing progress, and to use a lack of results to doom a facility that each year brings animals and children closer is foolish. I only make this note because a majority of the marketing that comes out of zoos portrays them as exceptionally educational experiences and leads many guests to believe that a majority of a zoo's research involves wild animals. Zoos have done a lot of great work with reintroductions and breeding programs, and their success as a whole should really be saved for later debates. That being said, I would heavily encourage zoo and aquarium administrations to put their money where their mouth is when it comes to such claims, and make decisions that really reflect that conservation is a higher priority than profit. But I again also express with extreme urgency that we cannot allow for the fact that progress is made slowly to doom what may be the last refuge for wildlife on our planet. But again, the primary point is that how well zoos function as a utility is irrelevant. So back to the main debate at hand. What many are really looking for is not whether captivity is cruel, but more specifically, whether quality of life is better or worse in captivity versus the wild as that's the focal point for many people's belief on whether it's ethical. In order to find an answer, we're going to have to do our best to find measures that define that quality. But before I dive headfirst into critically analyzing how well zoos and aquariums have managed um, quality of life in captivity over the years, I want to take a second to look at many reported behaviors that the anti-captivity movement consistently uses to justify that animals are unhappy. In my time at Brookfield, I've overheard an unbelievable variety of observations from guests when it comes to animal behavior. Most of these are based solely on attributing human characteristics to the animals in question. This is something that we call anthropomorphism. One of the most common is, he looks so blank. You can fill in the blank with happy, sad, or another emotion. My response is typically, well, first of all, that's actually a female. And secondly, that's just what they look like. A big mistake in reading animal body language is attributing too much communication to the face. While it does exist in other ways of body language with other species, it's mostly a primate trait. A dolphin's natural smile or a toad's natural frown indicate absolutely nothing of the animal's emotional state, because that's simply the shape that their mouth is fixed in. Even when we come face-to-face -face with our closest genetic relatives, we fail to reason why their body language would differ from our own and we often mistake a fang flash or teeth bearing as a smile, when more often than not, depending on the species, it's a sign of submission, dominance, or aggression. The other mistake is observing behaviors that humans might show when depressed, and assuming that if the animal shows that behavior, then it too must be depressed. While some symptoms do cross over the species threshold, I find that a majority of these observations really barely count as symptoms at all. A common behavior I've seen animals exhibit that elicits a sympathetic response from a crowd is often lethargic in nature. A family may come across a wallaby that is laying in the corner of its exhibit just staring at a wall. Where this might be a sign of sadness or depression in humans, more often than not, that wallaby is just trying to find a secluded place to sleep. Many animals may appear lethargic to you when you witness them in captivity, but to assume that these are symptoms of depression or stress is simply anthropomorphism at work. 
Many species are nocturnal and are trying to sleep when you visit. Many are expert survivalists when it comes to conserving energy and just appear lazy most of the day. And many more than that have completely different standards of comfort and resting rituals than humans. And don't get me wrong, it makes me really happy that people are empathetic enough to have concern over these animals. But if they're going to have that empathy, they must also have a level of understanding to the needs of that animal that are often very different from our own. An important comparison to make when understanding animal behavior in captivity is that between an animal and its wild counterparts. Many zoo visitors might perceive an exhibit where the animal spends nearly all of its time walking, eating, sleeping, and then repeating all of those as cruel and unusual because we can never imagine a life like that ourselves. But in the wild, they would exhibit nearly the same exact behaviors. Male lions sleep on average 18 to 20 hours a day. So seeing a lazy lion in a zoo is not a variable that changes between the wild and captivity. Polar bears have been recorded swimming for 10 days straight. Does that mean that they need a swimming pool that is large enough for them to complete that feat in captivity? Or rather, do we just simply fail to understand the hunger of these wild animals that drive them to such exhaustion and fatigue? To get good indicators of quality of life, we need to look past our anthropomorphic tendencies and find behaviors that really actually indicate stress. When we analyze quality of life for animals and we try to improve it, there are two basic categories of variables that we need to concern ourselves with, the sum of which will indicate the quality that we seek. For an animal to achieve the maximum quality of life, it must minimize the amount of negative stress stimuli and maximize the amount of positive engaging stimuli. Each of these two can also be broken down into psychological variables and physical variables. Examples of a negative psychological variable would be restriction, fear, boredom, or frustration. Examples of negative physical variables are things like hunger, sickness, injury, temperature extremes, or environmental discomforts. All of these things have the ability to lower quality of life significantly. So if we're looking to make the animal's life the best we can, it's very important to minimize these factors. When looking at positive psychological variables, we're looking for mentally stimulating or relieving tasks such as exploration, socialization, and play. Positive physical variables have to do with satisfying bodily urges such as sex, urination, and positive sensory experiences. These are factors that we need to maximize in order to provide the best quality of life. It's all too common to assume that caring for only the basic physical needs of animals will constitute a good quality of life, but we know quite certainly that mental stimulation is by far one of the most important factors to health and happiness. So with our object in mind to, to compare captive animals with their wild counterparts, we now have the variables we need to consider quality of life accurately, but how do we measure these variables? There's no clear scientific consensus on how to measure or even define psychological well-being in humans, let alone non-human animals, when you confound the inability to communicate their own mental state. Currently, there are two methods that we use as proxies to measure stress and welfare, measuring physiological responses and observing behavioral responses. Neither of these approaches can be used exclusively as authority on the topic, so we'll try to use both of these measures going forward with our discussion. I think it's worth mentioning that while this comparison does illuminate a lot of important information in deciding whether captivity is right or wrong, even if we find that captive animals have a better quality of life, it doesn't ensure that they have the best possible, nor does it suggest that that quality can't be improved. It is my belief that if captive animals have a better quality of life than in the wild, captivity really can't be cruel. But many might disagree. And they would argue that ownership of these animals gives us an obligation to give them the best quality of life, not simply a step better than that of the wild. And it's hard to argue with that. Perhaps in a way, by justifying ownership and keeping the power to determine an animal's quality of life entirely in our hands, we do demand a much higher ceiling than simply comparing them to their wild counterparts. But again, 
back to the matter at hand. Let's start with wild animals. Since the majority of the human population has detached itself from our natural upbringing, I really noticed an alarming trend of romanticizing the wild. It seems that in our separation, we have kind of forgotten some of the factors that drove us to build our engineered environment. While nature certainly has its aesthetic beauty, the harsh reality is that things like starvation, murder, and infanticide are regular sights in the natural world. A very large number of wild animal deaths I have witnessed are long and grueling, and include ends such as being eaten, chewed on, and swallowed while still alive, being pulled underwater and drowned alive, and of course, many of you have probably seen on TV, um, when predators get their prey, most of them are pulling limbs off and pulling chunks of flesh off while that animal's still alive. When orcas separate a whale calf from her mom and tear her small body into chunks while her mom watches helplessly, we feel horrified. But that is nature's way. When two siblings share a nest, birds, the bigger one will bully its little sibling out of food until the sibling starves to death. While this occurs, the mother bird purposefully only feeds the stronger one. This is, of course, intentional to increase the chance of survival, because that's nature's way, but it is still horrifying. We need to get past our illusions of the natural world being a sanctuary of freedom from suffering, because it can be absolutely brutal out there. That being said, it's also important to realize that for other individuals and other species, the wild can be immensely less stressful and only slightly more dangerous than captivity. When we talk about wide-ranged, very large apex predators, they don't have the same quality of life as smaller prey animals in the wilderness because they have completely different concerns for survival. While smaller prey animals may suffer stress over being hunted and killed, larger predators generally don't. While animals on the savanna may feel the stress of starvation and drought during the dry season, gorillas and other liked animals living in the dense rainforest have a plethora of food available to them at all times. Again, we simply find that sweeping generalizations do us no good in this topic, and that we have to understand that nature can be varying levels of stressful for each species. Currently, one of the best non-invasive methods we have to measure stress is to analyze glucocorticoids, or cortisol, in animal feces, saliva, urine, or blood. In lab settings, we see this level spike with exposure to general stressors in a statistically significant way. I will note the significance of making sure the measure is non-invasive, because any kind of restraint for an invasive test would easily stress the animal and skew the results. The real issue in attempting to compare the results of wild and captive animals is the unsurprising amount of confounding variables that exist. In a study with Atlantic bottlenose dolphins, they found the cortisol levels to be the highest in wild populations. Then very closely in second was the captive populations, and then by far the lowest was captive populations that included husbandry techniques to assist in drawing a sample. It's easy to read only the order and assume captivity is less stressful, but in truth, it's the catch and release method used for the first two that simply elevates the levels far above the individuals who were trained to come in for testing. Another problem is the sheer volume of different species to study. One study done by the University of Oxford in 2003 found the levels of infant mortality and stereotypy were positively correlated with constraints on natural roaming behaviors due to captivity of wide-range carnivores. In the discussion of the results, they concluded that captivity for these specific animals needed to be either fundamentally improved or phased out. Another study found that epinephrine and norepinephrine were significantly higher in wild animals than domestic. But again, upon discussing the results, noted that evolutionarily, domestication weeded out animals that had a disposition for high anxiety and that wild animals needed stress and fear to survive where domestic animals didn't. So when it comes to examining studies, there's quite a bit of frustration when we want a generic answer. But if we look close enough, we do find a lot of truth. It's absolutely true that stress is an incredibly beneficial tool in survival when animals are in the wild. So finding so many cases where wild animals have higher stress levels than captive counterparts should be expected especially considering commonplace catch-and-release techniques that are used to get results. And that is the case with many species. 
But unfortunately, we do find examples where stress is incomparably heightened with certain captive species, more specifically complex social intelligent animals. It should be noted that of the species I've studied where there was no significant stress difference between uh, captive and wild animals, most were a part of the study due to the funding of the institute they belong to. In other words, if we find no significant increase in stress at one facility, it does not mean that all facilities are humane. And more likely than not, the studied animals were at very nice facilities where animal care and welfare is a precedent. We have to remember there also exists underfunded organizations where animal care is absolutely unacceptable, even for animals that appear to be happy in captivity. And that's a very important point. Allowing for captivity of animals to occur or standing by it does not dismiss the need to reform or improve their conditions. In addition to simply the size of an enclosure, there are many factors that can create stressful situations, even if everything else is done right. A study done on great horned owls showed a significant rise in cortisol levels when handled during the day instead of night, when those individuals were most active. Factors like sound, temperature, handling, scent, cohabitation, routine, and training all have tremendous effects on stress, and it's important that we look specifically at each individual case in order to evaluate how to give it the least stressful life we can. Now, if I chose to, I could linger on this topic for a very long time. It would be great to go into details of all the stressors of captivity and how to reduce them, but we get rather away from the main point. If you're interested in learning more about these, there are thousands of studies online that you can find right now. But moving on, from our earlier discussion, we know that generalizations don't work with the ethics of captivity. And we also know that whether life is more or less stressful in the wild depends on the species. So instead of beating around the bush any longer about all the species that exist, I want to focus on species that are at the real center of this discussion. The animals that show traits most similar to humans, the socially intelligent animals like elephants, cetaceans, and primates. After the release of Blackfish, the anti-captivity movement really took off. The film, which was primarily focused on the dangerous nature of allowing trainers to get in the water with Tilikum, a male orca, touched on the factors that drove him to the possibly aggressive behavior he displayed. Since then, California has passed real legislation on matters of captivity, and it has become another polarizing political topic in the U.S. I think to condense our discussion so far, Captivity can be completely ethical depending on the circumstances of the facility and the species, considering that species have lives that are just as, if not more enriching, with similar or fewer stressors. Whether ownership requires more responsibility than that, or whether safety and happiness are merits that outweigh freedom of action, are personal decisions that you need to decide for yourself. So while we have in a way used reason to deduce that captivity isn't in itself unethical, We've discussed an assortment of conditions that, if not met, can lead to inhumane and unethical captivity. When we talk about the following socially intelligent animals, it's important to know that the reason these animals are at the focal point of our discussion is because they need the most positive stimuli to stay healthily engaged and are incredibly sensitive to an amazing amount of negative stimuli that other species don't deal with. One of the most important questions we should ask ourselves before putting an animal in captivity is of all the options available, can we give this animal the best quality of life possible? If the answer is anything but yes, we need to evaluate how we can restructure our society to do better before pursuing the idea any further. This concept opens a whole new can of worms when it comes to discussing captivity. As an animal's habitat shrinks and humans continue to pollute and destroy the ecosystems that these animals live in, we see a sharp drop in their population. For obvious reasons, this occurs because the animals have nowhere else to go. When the point comes in our society, as many now believe it will, when there is nowhere else for these animals to go, is it better to let them go extinct? Or is it better to keep them alive in captivity? We must remember that extinction is a natural process in nature, but humans have accelerated it to match only that of the last few mass extinctions. I believe the answer lies very closely with the topic at hand. If we can prove as we have that captivity can exist in a more positive light than even that of the wild, I see no reason why we can't continue to use zoos and aquariums as an arc of sorts, preserving the last remnants we might have of our wildlife on this planet. <laughs>
Although, for me personally, the reason I follow this line of belief has nothing to do with the preservation of species, but rather the preservation of individual animals. I see no specific reason to keep animals like the giant panda or the cheetah in existence other than superficial beauty, but I see great reason to give each member of that species a happy and enriching life. In other words, my desire in conservation and preservation is to ensure the best quality of life for each individual animal in the group, not to save the genetic idea of cheetah or any other species for that matter. The only exception I feel is important is with social animals, whose quality of life is determined directly by having group to socialize with. I think conservationists as a whole need to ask questions about why their efforts are focused specifically on preserving the idea of species rather than preserving the quality of life for all those animals. Sometimes these ideas go hand in hand. Stopping poachers from illegally hunting animals can do both at the same time. But my motivation in doing so is to stop the pain and suffering of the individuals, rather than to make sure that rhinos are still in existence today. I do expect to meet some resistance with this idea, and maybe it's just my cynical nature. But if humans went extinct in a thousand years, on the sole condition that every member lived a long and happy life, I really would see no problem with that. While there are many species that are incredibly beneficial to humans, from bees to bats, we come to another question that really digs into our ideas as a society. Should we really judge the ability to exist on the utility that animals offer to us as humans? In a perfect world where we could preserve all of nature and let it run its course, we wouldn't have to ask questions like this. But corporate greed and political systems that only care about re-elections and donations make these realistic premises and force us to, to question why things should exist. Because nature is no longer the only ones making these decisions. We are as well. Once again, we have traveled down another interesting development <laughs> far from the main point, and we must reel ourselves back into discussing these socially intelligent animals and what their quality of life is like in captivity. Studies on elephants have shown size of enclosure to actually be one of the least important factors to their well-being. In this study, they used health, stereotypic behavior, and reproductive success as measures for general stress. The largest risk factors were actually isolation and inter-zoo movement. This suggests an enormous importance on the social aspects of their lives. In a massive study that analyzed the lifespan of African elephants in captivity over the last 45 years, they found that wild elephants live significantly longer than their captive counterparts, three times longer on average, in fact. In another study done in the UK, researchers found that out of 77 elephants, 71% were considered overweight and only 11 could walk properly. And again, in another study done across 68 accredited zoos in North America, researchers found that over 75% of elephants showed stereotypic behavior such as swaying or rocking. You get the general idea. It's clear from the data that there are systemic problems with the way we understand basic husbandry for these animals. But it's important to note that inferring behavior and looking at general health are not always the best guidelines when it comes to happiness. It does, however, give us an idea of the abysmal condition of the elephants in the captive population. Though to be fair, in the U.S., approximately 68% of Americans are overweight, according to the National Institute of Health. It's not unreasonable to suggest that elephants could simply be lazy and unhealthy, but still happy. Although, due to the amount of data on reproductive success and chronic stress, this seems highly unlikely. Elephants are not flourishing in captivity, and as evidenced by the survival and breeding rates, there are clear signs that there is physical and psychological compromise. Studies on orcas have shown very similar concerns in regards to survival and infant mortality rates, with lifespans only half to two-thirds as long as their wild counterparts, and infant mortality rates around 4-6% in captivity versus 2-3% in the wild. There have also been biochemistry studies that have found that captive orca populations cannot accurately model wild populations anymore because of the influence of stress hormones and medication given to those animals. But by far, the largest degree of change between the wild population and the captive population is in behavior. Stereotypic behavior is found in incredibly high rates, and social hierarchy is now determined by behavioral dominance in captivity rather than fluid social organization like it is in the wild.
I'd like to stress here that zoos and aquariums can be doing a lot of good for orcas they care for, but these numbers are still unacceptable. It is incredibly clear from research that orcas suffer serious behavior and health problems due to captivity, and drastic steps need to be taken if we want to give these animals the best quality of life possible. For primates who can vary in size and complexity from a lemur to an orangutan, understanding their ability to thrive in captivity has always been an interest, as not only are they seen in zoos, but are often used in laboratory settings as a bridge to human trials for specific products. As before, studies on behavior have revealed a lot of significant differences between captive and wild populations. A recent study found marked abnormal behavior in all of its sampled populations, abnormal being considered atypical from their wild counterparts that couldn't be attributed to things like sex, illness, or other variables that were differential. Studies that have also been done to assess what causes these abnormal behaviors and found that the single greatest factor was the method of rearing, even over environmental conditions. For example, primates that were reared in facilities like circuses, traveling zoos, or trading markets exhibited much higher levels of abnormal behavior than those reared in an accredited zoological setting. Other important factors that they found for behavior included things like group dynamics and social hierarchies. As a comparison from 1,023 hours of observation for wild chimpanzees in Uganda, that same study found that none of those abnormal traits were seen in the wild population. I repeat, from 1,023 hours of observation of wild chimpanzees, they found zero cases where they saw abnormal traits in the wild population. Similar to elephants, researchers were surprised to learn that from all the variables, size of enclosure was actually one of the least impactful influences on stereotypic behavior. Now, while no one can claim that these behaviors link directly to quality of life, they are almost always indicators of suboptimal care or health. In conclusion from looking at these few brief examples of more socially complex animals, we see the notion of captivity as simply being a construct of restricting physical space being directly challenged again, as the greatest influence on our quality of life measures all had to do with management rather than space. That being said, regardless of which variable of captivity was the most responsible for the results, we still see results that do not indicate a good quality of life for these animals. For the species that these studies investigated, it is an absolute ethical necessity to reevaluate how we can make these animals thrive better in captivity or begin to phase out these animals entirely. It is not an anti-zoo statement to say that these animals deserve the best quality of life we can offer. It is entirely pro-animal. The realization that certain species need to be phased out of zoos is not the same as condemning zoos to shut down. It is a simple understanding that we cannot generalize the quality of captivity for each species, and that what zoos can currently provide for one species to make it happy simply might not for another. I firmly believe we can reach a point where quality of life for animals is that high, but it will take a lot of resources from institutes, it'll take a lot of patience from animal care staff, it'll take a lot more scientifically funded research, and a lot more empathy from all parties involved. I want to take a second to thank all of you so much for listening to this podcast. I know the content was pretty heavy, and if you've made it this far, it's very clear to me that you care deeply enough about this issue to want a more full understanding. And trust me, if we're going to continue to improve the lives of humans, and especially animals around the world for generations to come, we're going to need a lot more people like you. That's all for this episode. Feel free to contact me on any of my social media profiles if you guys have any questions or comments about our discussion today. And I want to thank you one more time for listening in to my first podcast.